Um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about cancer immunology. Um, I have to spend a little bit of time um, at the beginning giving you um, some general background on cancer. I know that it is certainly far less than many of you will have had in other courses, especially if you're, say, in Dunaway's cancer course. Um, but there are a few points that we just have to make sure we're all clear about because they're going to become really important as we talk about the immunology aspects. Um, so first of all, there are a few different terms that um, are related to cancer that people sometimes throw around a little bit interchangeably and they really aren't always interchangeable. And so I want to start out by talking about um, the processes of transformation and saying a couple things about mutations. So cells can undergo mutation in DNA following some exposure to mutagen, following some error of a polymerase, whatever. You've seen all of that before. Um, I think some students always take mutation as going straight to and then you die. Um, sort of like, they're, like mutation is always bad and then it's, it, it's a really terrible thing that happens. Um, but I want you to realize that mutations can be positive, <coughs> negative, or neutral. Um, you know, a mutation, yes, can potentially lead to cancer. A mutation can also make you an X-Men. Um, or, um, and in fact, evolution-wise, um, blue eyes was a, at one point a mutation. Um, and so, you know, that's we can say neutralish. You can imagine others that are even that have actually no phenotypic consequence as well. So mutation is just a change in the DNA. One possible outcome out of many um, is transformation. And transformation is usually something we talk about when we talk about cells in culture, like in the cells in a dish we've seen in the lab. So transformation is when we have a cell in a culture that is different from a normal cell. It is transformed. Um, because it's not controlled by the normal cell growth and cell death processes. Um, so cells are normally dividing. There's normally undergoing some apoptosis. And so we kind of have this homeostasis in terms of cell number. If we have a mutation that increases cell division or a mutation that decreases apoptosis, we can see excess numbers of cells. Um, I'm sure he's going to come in. Hi. <laughs> Yes. Ah, yeah, okay, you got my buddy. All right. I got it, don't worry. I was just getting ready to... You were going to fill in a lot of the details and, like, please don't roll it. I was just getting ready to talk about this. Um, and so the basic idea with transformation is that you have a normal, happy cell. See, it's a normal, happy cell. That gets some sort of insult that happens to it. And that cell changes. and becomes a sad, problematic cell. <laughs> um, and so this can, be ha this can happen as a result of uh, mutation. This can actually happen as a result of viral infection, as I'll say going forward. All mutations, all viral infections don't lead to transformation. It's really the ones that influence growth or death processes. And this is what we see happening with things like the cell lines we have in culture, like the THP1 cells. Sometimes people talk about those cells like cancer in a dish. And that's not entirely true. Those are transformed cells. But in fact, just a transformed cell is not necessarily enough to cause a tumor or to cause cancer. Um, generally, when we are thinking about having um, a cell uh, that is going to eventually become a tumor and become some type of cancer, we think about a phenomenon known as the multi-hit hypothesis. In the multi-hit hypothesis, um, we can imagine that in order to get some type of tumor, our cell has to accumulate multiple changes, multiple mutations, aka multiple hits. Um, and so we might have a cell here that undergoes one mutation that makes it proliferate a little faster than normal. That cell might get another mutation further increasing proliferation, um, things like that. Oftentimes, some of those hits might be in things like DNA repair genes or cell cycle control genes so that when something bad happens, we can't repair it or we can't we can't sort of stop the cell cycle to deal with it. And so 
you can sort of see that that cell is going to be predisposed to more errors if it can't get repair. And so maybe it gets that first hit in a repair pathway, and then it picks up more errors because it can't do repair. Um, and so only after sort of the combination of a lot of different types of changes in those growth and death pathways will we really start to see the production of some type of cancer. In each individual tumor, there usually will be a series of hits that have to happen, but it's not always the same sequence. It's not always the same genes. And in every individual tumor, there is probably a unique series of events that happened in order to lead that cell to be a cell that's proliferating uncontrollably. And so here you can see cell one sort of mutated over there first, and then over here, and then over there, and went down this pathway. And then cell number two mutated different, a different set of genes, and number three mutated a different set in order. Um, and so each tumor is unique in terms of the specific mutations it has, as well as the order in which those occurred. Um, this figure is just the figure from your textbook indicating the multi-hit hypothesis. So it's largely the same thing that I've told you before, just coming from your textbook. So you can see that our cell might get some type of mutation, some hit that can come from lots of places that might make that cell say hyperproliferative, might proliferate a little too much. Then that cell can get some other type of change that will further alter its proliferation and on and on and on until we actually get to sort of what we normally think of um, as cancer. Usually when we're talking about cancer, we're not really thinking so much about just transformation. We're really thinking about this process of oncogenesis. And oncogenesis is the actual development of tumor or a, you know, a cancer, a clinical cancer. Transformation is what happens in cell culture. When cells are not able to be controlled by normal growth and death processes. So those cells that we have in a dish are transformed cells. To be cancer, a cell does have to be transformed but it also needs some additional changes. So just because a cell is transformed doesn't mean it's actually oncogenic and can lead to some sort of tumor. Um, if I were to inject some of those transformed cells into you that we have in the lab, you would not necessarily get cancer because those cells may not be able to do the other stuff even though they are transformed. And so I don't really love it talking about transform cells as cancer in a dish because there is sort of this extra set of steps. Um, off, classically, we talk about the six hallmarks of cancer, that there are six things that a cell has to be able to do in order to be oncogenic. Um, one of them is that they have to be able to stimulate their own growth. Um, that can sometimes mean just that they grow a lot. Sometimes it means they do things like make growth factors to feed themselves or make cytokines to feed themselves. Um, you know, they're not, they're sort of growing too much. They ignore growth inhibiting signals. So things that should tell them to stop, don't stop them. They avoid death by apoptosis. And you can kind of be like, well, those things sound pretty much like transformation. They replicate constantly. That sounds like transformation. But in order to make a tumor, these cells usually have to be able to modify some aspect of the environment around them to develop their own blood supply. They need to lead to blood vessel genesis or angiogenesis so that the tumor can actually be fed with blood and be, get nutrients. And so, you know, if a transformed cell in a dish may not actually be able to do that. Um, if a tumor is metastatic, that tumor also has to be able to travel around the body from its ori original site of origin to some other type of site. Um, all the people in this class who have taken who, or are taking Dunaway's cancer class, um, at least I'm assuming he taught this, I guess I don't totally know for sure, but I'm pretty sure, um, m can probably tell you that um, a lot of scientists think about more than six hallmarks of cancer at this point. There are, there's, there are a lot of other ones that are sort of listed. Um, I'm going to give you a seventh one today, but I think I've seen up to 12. Um, but these are sort of the classic six. Um, so 
one other final sort of general thing I want to um, say about cancer is a little bit about causes. So anything that can sort of lead to those types of changes in DNA that can influence cell growth and death pathways can potentially be causative. Um, we can see lots of different environmental and lifestyle factors that may lead to mutations. Um, you know, the famous one of, of sun exposure, UV exposure. But you can think of a lot of different things that might cause mutation. And so there are things like that. There are things like, you know, being unlucky with your DNA replication or um, with mutations you've inherited. So there, there are all of those types of things. And there are a number of viruses that also can cause cancer. Um, and so this is a list of some of the viruses that can cause cancer. The most famous one that you've probably heard of is HPV, causing cervical cancer. It causes a number of other cancer types as well. Um, but there are others here that are shown. Um, and so there are a lot of different cancer types um, that are caused by viruses. Um, so at this point, we can sort of start to shift a little bit into thinking about immunology. And we might ask the question, well, why are we talking about this in an immunology class? Why do immunologists care at all about cancer? Um, and I will also tell you that the, the way that I have structured this lecture is a little bit um, biased in terms of when I got my PhD, because the, the views of cancer immunology have changed a bit over time. And so part of this is like the, an older view, but I'll get to that in a second. So let's imagine that we sort of didn't have any idea, and you might think, well, why do immunologists care about cancer? One reason why you might care, and why you could say that you should care, is that pathogens can cause cancer. And the immune system is responsible for combating pathogens. So we've got all of these viruses, these DNA and RNA viruses, that can lead to tumor types. And so we can easily see that if there are situations where you know, the immune system is responsible for defense against pathogens, that this sort of thing is clearly in the domain of the immunologist and a thing that immunologists should be thinking about. Yep, Mark. OK. Um, and so it, you could be like, OK, so I get why immunologists care about the viral cancers. And you might be like, but OK, but what about all the ones from like sunburns? Why do immunologists care about that kind of stuff? Well, one reason that you could think of is that when we um, are trying to treat cancer patients, one of uh, the things that we tend to do is we tend to use either radiation or chemotherapy in order to kill rapidly dividing cells with the idea of killing those rapidly dividing tumor cells. Um, there is a problem with these therapies in that they are really, really nonspecific. They kill all of the rapidly dividing cells in the body. And that turns out to mean your immune cells. And so by and large, patients who are getting treated with these treatments can be immunocompromised because these are such broad treatments. Um, and so we can see you know, a person who's getting radiation and chemotherapy will be immunocompromised, and we will have to give them a bone marrow transplant in order to reconstitute their immune system. Um, and this is done for a treatment of a huge number of types of cancers. Um, and so you might say, okay, well, immunologists care about cancer because when we treat cancer, we mess up the immune system. And all of our cancer treatments impact the immune system. So uh, that might be a reason why immunologists care about this stuff. Um, and sort of that is all uh, certainly um, a really important thing to think about. Um, messing up your immune system, of course, is not the only side effect of radiation or chemo. Um, we kill rapidly dividing cells in a lot of places, like hair follicles, like in the lining of the GI tract, um, things like that. Um, so that's, that's one reason. And sort of classically, we also can say, well, immunologists clearly should care about cancer because there are cancers of the immune system. B cells and T cells and all of those types of cells can become transformed um, and lead to tumor types like myelomas and leukemias and lymphomas. 
Um, in fact, if you look at a rank list of different tissue types and how frequently they lead to tumors, um, immune cells rank pretty high. Um, and a lot of that has to do with BDJ recombination, the fact that we're having DNA breaks um, happening in these developing B cells and T cells. And so there's sort of a risk of mutation and things going wrong. Um, here you can see one very famous um, place where things go wrong, where we get a translocation. Um, and we put the promoter that drives antibody production, the promoter on the Ig gene, in front of, it gets pushed or joined, ligated to the wrong piece of DNA, and it gets ligated right in front of the MYC gene, which is an oncogene, and so we get excess proliferation because that promoter is driving MYC. And so we can be like, well, yeah, I mean, I'll just clearly have to care about cancers of the immune system, like, duh. But again, we still have this little question about, like, what about, like, the skin cancer you get from laying out in the sun? Like, is that something that is, like, thought about or that we should be thinking about in terms of immunology. And for a long time, immunologists said no. That is not relevant. That is not immunology, not the bearing of the immune system. When I started grad school, there were a lot of people, who, a lot of my professors were like not into cancer immunology. They thought it was like not real. Now it's like super huge and like your textbook, if you look at it, is like cancer immunology and doesn't even like present it to you as if there ever was any doubt. Um, but I want to tell you, give you a little bit of the taste of that doubt only because it does help us frame a couple of issues that we have with this field. So I want you to think for a second back to the terribly old days where I was a PhD student. Um, and where people would say, no, the immune system doesn't do anything about cancer. The one, the, like the breast cancer, the mutation cancer, the UV cancer, like the virus cancer, everyone's like, yeah, we, we, we know there's some immune system role in the virus cancer. But in all the other ones, people were like, nope, definitely not, not our, not our problem. Why do you think people were saying no? Why did this, was there this idea that there was no immune response to cancer? Yeah, cancer is a self-cell. And so what we were somehow, if you believed that cancer immunology was a thing, you were saying that somehow you were having this response to self-cells. Um, and we talked about lots of ways where peripheral tolerance keeps us from having responses to self-cells. And having responses to self-cells is not really a thing. And so for a long time, people were like, nope, cancer's self. Your immune system doesn't care. Like, it's not a thing. Um, but there were some other people who were making some observations. One thing that people could observe is that when you looked at tumors under the microscope by histology, you could see a bunch of tumor cells, which are pointed to in the red arrows, but whenever you actually looked at the tumor, it was full of lymphocytes. And so they said, huh, why are there so many lymphocytes there if the immune system's not doing anything? <laughs> this, this doesn't make any sense. So this suggested that maybe the immune system was doing something. But it was hard to imagine what the heck was going on with antigens in this case, because it's a transformed self-cell. Things got a lot um, sort of bigger, the cancer immunology really started to grow um, with a few other sets of observations. Um, and these were kind of observations that were in different places in different times, but all really were talking about the same thing. So one was that in the 80s and 90s, um, when we started to see a lot of patients with HIV, um, which of course leads to AIDS and is, leads to patients being immunocompromised or immunosuppressed. They lose reactions of their immune system. Those patients were sometimes dying of other types of infections, but some of those patients were getting cancers. And sometimes they were viral cancers, but sometimes they were like not viral cancers. Sometimes there were other types of cancers that the AIDS patients were dying of. 
And so there was this idea that if you were, had a lacking immune system, you had an increased risk of cancer. And so that kind of made you think, well, the immune system must be doing something about cancer. But again, it was sort of like, but, but it's a self thing. What? Immunologists also had two different strains of mice that they worked with, either nude mice, which are lacking a thymus, or skid mice, which are lacking a cytokine receptor gene and don't have B cells or T cells. So these are two different um, types of mice that are missing the adaptive immune system. And people just do experiments with them. That's fine. But it turns out if you just like let them sit in your mouse facility for a really long time and don't do anything to them, they all end up with nasty tumors, like really gross tumors. And so again, it was like, wait, if your immunocompromised mice just sit around for a long time, they all die of cancer. And so again, you're like, huh, that kind of suggests that the immune system, the normal immune system is doing something about cancer. But again, it still leaves, leaves us with this antigen problem. Um, people then started to do some experiments to try to test this hypothesis that the immune system is doing something in response to tumor cells. Um, some of these experiments are kind of similar to stuff I've already told you about, um, but people started to do experiments like this, where they could take a mouse and inject dead tumor cells, tumor cells that had undergone radiation, into a mouse. And then, and that's sort of like what we see with a vaccine, right? You're injecting a irradiated, dead, inactivated microbe. And then if we injected the mouse with live cells of the same tumor, the mouse didn't get a tumor. If we had just injected with live cells in the first place, the mouse would have a little red bump of a tumor. But if we previously gave the mouse irrad irradiated tumor cells, then suddenly the mouse was protected, which looked like an adaptive immune response. And if we injected viable cells of a different tumor type, the mouse still got the tumor. So it was specific, like an adaptive immune response. And so people said, huh, there, there does seem to be some type of adaptive immune responses um, to tumors. In particular, um, people seemed to see a response with T cells. Um, and so we could take a mouse that has some type of tumor that you uh, induced by using a chemical carcinogen. So this isn't a virus tumor, this is a mutation tumor because you use some kind of chemical to induce mutations in that mouse. You got a tumor, you can take it from the mouse, you can transplant it back into the original mouse, assume that that first mouse's immune system was like primed, no tumor. You, if you transplant it into another mouse, it does actually work. It's not like the transplant doesn't work. It will make tumors in some mice, but not in mice that were sort of previously immune. And if you take T cells out of that previously immune mouse, put it in a mouse and then give it the tumor, the tumor also dies. So again, it's like, wait, it's like that there's a T cell response. There are these primed activated T cells that seem to be specifically responding to the tumor. Um, and these types of data really indicated that yes, um, the immune system does play a role in combating cancer cells, even those cancer cells that are coming from mutations. It left open, of course, some issues about the antigen and like how in the heck are you getting a response against self? We now know some things about the antigens and the response against self. And on the next two slides, I'm going to show you some things about the antigens and the response against self. But I will say that in a lot of places, this is still kind of a weak point for some parts of cancer immunology. Um, it is entirely possible that every tumor has its own antigens because of that multi-hit hypothesis and the fact that every tumor is picking up a different set of mutations. And so each tumor might be super unique in terms of what those antigens are. Um, and so there's a lot of work we do need to do to think about that. With the antigens that we do know about, um, they can fall into um, a few different types. This slide, shows them as three different types. 
Um, and I'm going to talk about them as three different types. But weirdly enough, we only use two different names for them. So two of them get lumped together. <laughs> and one of them is uh, not. So, so I get that this is a, that's a little bit weird. So we've seen that in order to have a tumor cell, we will have some types of mutations get made. Each tumor is unique. It has its own specific mutations. Those mutations are going to lead to altered peptides, altered proteins. And those proteins can be presented as self on MHC. However, they're not going to be the normal self protein that the T cells saw in the thymus. They're an altered self protein. They're a changed self protein. And so in fact, those would be basically foreign proteins, not the same old self protein that the T cells learned about in the thymus. It's something new and foreign. And so sometimes the mutated proteins, or the proteins that came from a result of mutation in the DNA, <laughs> um, are the antigens themselves, the altered self proteins. So mutation generates a new peptide that gets presented. Each of these are probably specific to an individual tumor like based on what mutation that tumor picked up. And so they are called tumor-specific antigens, or TSAs, because <laughs> they're specific to what mutation the tumor had. There are two other types of antigens that are commonly seen um, in tumors. Both of them are sort of general classes of things. Um, and so instead of being called tumor-specific antigens, they're called tumor-associated antigens, TAAs, um, because you could see them in many different types of tumors. Um, so one of them I will I'll talk about is this one first. If we have some protein that is uh, altered um, in its production in a cancer cell, we might see that that protein is being produced at a super high level. As a result, there's going to be way more of it than normal on the surface of the cell. And so perhaps we have overexpression. And maybe having one copy of it on the surface of the cell wouldn't really stimulate T cells too much. But when you have 10 copies of it on the surface of the cell, that's going to lead to sort of excess stimulation. And so overexpression of a normal protein could perhaps be a tumor-associated antigen. We also see in some cases that there are um, genes that are not normally expressed, particularly in adult tissues, that may get turned on inappropriately. And so sometimes there are some genes that you only uh, express during development. Those proteins are only in your cells during development. So you know they aren't really self because you, your adult T cells have never seen them, that might get inappropriately turned back on these embryonic genes. And so sometimes these embryonic genes will get turned back on. You will get um, presentation of these new peptides as tumor-associated antigens. Um, and these figures from your textbook um, talk a little bit about this. Um, so and we've got a few different common um, tumor antigens. He stole the pointer. At least I'm blaming him. Um, so here you can see samples um, from uh, patients with a number of different liver diseases. What you can notice is if they have sort of alcoholic cirrhosis, hepatitis, um, they don't really have this embryonic antigen turned back on. But in the people who have this liver carcinoma, weirdly enough, a lot of times this embryonic antigen gets turned back on. And so that could be a tumor-associated antigen. And here again, here we can look at another one in people with uh, cancers versus other diseases. And in cancers, you seem to see frequently um, turning back on of these embryonic genes. And that may be just because of gene expression going screwy in cancer cells. Um, we can see a few other types of tumor antigens. Some of them are based on overexpression. Some of them are differentiation stage. Some of them are mutation-based. And of course, some of them are the ones that are shown at the very top on this figure, which are things from viruses. If a virus is causing the cancer, then there's an obvious 
potential antigen there, which is the thing from the virus being the antigen. And so these are some of the antigens that we do think about with types of tumors. Um, and they're things that you should be aware of as we're talking through sort of the rest of this. All of these types of data that I'm showing you um, led to sort of the um, proposal of a specific immunological theory. And that theory is known as the cancer immunoediting theory. Um, and we now think that this is a major part of all aspects of cancer biology. And so all cancers have to sort of deal with the problems that I'm going to show you in the cancer immunoediting theory. There are three phases to the cancer immunoediting theory. And the first phase is shown here. And so what we think happens is that very frequently there are cells that are transformed in the body or cells that un have some types of mutations. Um, and different immune cells are going to be able to eliminate them. And so you can see that right now you might have had a cell that screwed up, like while you're sitting here right now, like the, the beginning of cancer, right now. And then your immune system came and killed it, and you're good. And so what will happen, based on this figure from the textbook, is your healthy tissue um, will get some cells that are transformed. They're not yet all the way to being oncogenic. They're just sort of a little bit out of control. They're a little bit bad. Immune cells may recognize those based on things like the tumor antigens we talked about, perhaps some of the NK activating molecules that respond to cell stress that we've talked about, any of those types of things. The immune cells will kill those tumor cells, and you will go back to living happily ever after with no tumor. You will never know that that cell went rogue. And so for much of your, the time, this sort of thing will be happening. Um, and so this phase is the first phase, elimination, where you've got these cells arising, but the immune system is eliminating them. And you go back to being sort of completely fine. However, because these cells have the ability to replicate, be a little bit out of control, they might keep picking up some mutations. Maybe they have progeny that now gets a second mutation or a third mutation instead of just that first one. And now that cell might be a bit more resistant to being killed by the immune system. So that cell has now figured out a way to resist the immune system a little bit. So the immune system is still killing some of the tumor cells, but the tumor cells are sticking around longer. And we kind of get to like a new normal, where we've got a few um, tumor cells getting killed. We've got a few that are sticking around for a longer time. And so this is known as the equilibrium phase, where we're going to start to see some variants develop. This is largely because when these cells are starting to mutate, they then get a propensity to mutate more, because they're bad at repair. Um, and they might sort of get to this equilibrium phase. Yep. Emily. Um, so at this point, I would not consider it oncogenic or transformed until phase three. Yep. You've got to imagine that the cell is sort of that you are always picking up mutations. But if you kill the original mutated cell, how does that me, So it, me, it kind of depends on what that original how that original mutated cell got mutated. So for example, there are some people who um, inherit a bad copy of RB. You're not going to kill every cell in your body with a bad copy of RB in that case, because like, that's all of them. Um, and so you, are, you might have a few cells that are bad. Um, they might not be as sort of prone to, to replicate. But eventually, some of them are going to figure out a way to get past it. And so you can imagine that maybe maybe even 99% of the time, the immune system kills it. But every so often, there's going to be one that's going to sneak around, and we're going to get to this equilibrium phase. OK, does that make sense? Yes. OK. Um, and there's one other sort of piece to this that I want to uh, put in. Um, this is, part, this is one of the new slides I like put together for this year, so I'm hoping it, it makes sense. <laughs> um, so we've talked about 
inflammation as an important process physiologically. We've seen that we can have some kind of injury, we have danger signals, we make cytokines, and those cytokines help with repair. And that repair actually includes things like proliferation to make the cells that, you know, to replace the dead skin cells from where you got a cut or whatever. And so you're going to see sort of this nice um, tissue proliferation. You're going to see regeneration, stem cells proliferating to kind of repair that wound. It turns out that those same processes of inflammation can potentially, if there's been some type of mutation, lead to excess proliferation. And inflammation can sort of further push along this, process, this cancer process, where we get excess proliferation from our cytokines. We get too much of this process, and maybe we start to have our cells um, being hyperproliferative. I added an arrow to this figure. So sometimes we get regeneration, but sometimes those cytokines, that excess proliferation of stem cells that should be part of repair, can lead to excess proliferation of cells in that area that may have mutated. And so inflammation and excess inflammation may sort of make this process worse or exacerbate this process. These are a small sliver of papers on this topic that have come out where people have actually realized that some of the pattern recognition receptors that respond to DNA also respond to damaged DNA and may be related to DNA repair. And so it's possible that when you have DNA damage, you get too much inflammation, and that excess inflammation contributes to hyperproliferation and cancer. And so in fact, the DNA damage might itself be sort of a stimulus that leads to extra immune responses as well. Um, and so we can see sort of that um, mutation process kind of pushing further um, proliferation, further potential escape or process down this immunoediting pathway um, because of the excess production of cytokines. In the end, we get to the third phase of the cancer immunoediting therapy, which is a phase known as the escape phase. Eventually, those tumor cells pick up so many mutations and so many ways to avoid the immune system that they are able to replicate without control and the immune system can no longer do anything. And so in order, we think that in order to have any sort of diagnosable tumors, to have a tumor replicate to the point where you could actually see it in some type of diagnostic, feel it, notice it in any way, it probably has had to replicate enough that it's had to escape. It's probably had to sort of completely get out of immune control. Um, and so um, most tumors or that we, as far as we can understand, have gone through all steps of these processes and as a part of being an oncogenic um, tumor, have actually learned to escape um, immune control. Um, this also kind of ties in nicely with a number of other observations about cancer. So it tells us why, if you're an immunodeficient mouse who just sits in your mouse cage for a long time, you have, it takes a little while, you don't get cancer the next day. It takes some time to sort of have the cells build up the mutations, go through these phases, and eventually get there. It also sort of, you know, you can see here, when a tumor is first visible on x-ray, it has 10 to the eighth cells. It's not one mutant cell, it's, that's 10, uh, bleh, that's 100 million <laughs> cells. Um, and so again, that, cell, that has probably led to some type of immune escape before we get to that. Um, this is also potentially why cancer tends to be seen in older individuals because they've had more time to accumulate those mutations and accumulate the immune evasiveness. Um, in these processes. Uh, and so in fact, um, immunologists often talk about um, the uh, seventh hallmark of cancer, where all cancers have to be able to avoid immune detection um, and have to be able to actually accomplish this escape 
So yeah, we've got the big six that I showed you before, um, but in fact, um, evading immune defenses is one of the new ones that it is very clear that can all cancer cells have to be able to do. Um, there are a few mechanisms that we know of or ways that we know of that tumor cells can use to avoid immune detection. So we know a few things about how tumor cells are avoiding immune detection. Um, this is showing you um, one of them. So you can imagine that we are going to see, let me go back to this for a second. So when we're sort of in this escape phase, we've got a whole bunch of mutated cells. Maybe each of them has its own specific unique set of mutations. Some of them might allow evasion, some of them might not. But we sort of have this heterogeneous population of cells that are going to be present. And so this could allow for sort of a little natural selection experiment. The ones that have picked up some changes that allow them to get away from the immune system are going to survive. And the ones that get killed by the immune system are going to get killed, because I already said that earlier in the sentence. Um, and so one of the big things that we can see selection with is that oftentimes um, our tumor cells will actually reduce the expression of MHC on their surface. So those cells normally have a lot of MHC. They get killed by CTLs. And so they'll just have less and less MHC on their surface, um, which can potentially reduce those cells' ability to get killed by uh, T cells. And this is actually a histology stain of um, a tumor. The brown staining is MHC. And so you can see the lack of brown staining through much of that tumor where we've seen this massive loss of MHC, and this tumor is actually hiding from the immune system. Um, some of the other ways that tumors are able to evade um, immunity are shown here. Um, so sometimes um, that cell, we will have had a tumor antigen, so a mutated protein that is getting presented. Some variants of that cell may reduce production of that mutated protein or stop producing that original mutated protein, stop producing that original antigen. And so we'll see loss of that antigen so again, the tumor is no longer going to get recognized. Um, here you actually are seeing loss of MHC again. Um, we could imagine things like the loss of um, RAE1, MCA, and MCB, those NK cell ligands. You can imagine the cell could just be like, no, I'm not making those anymore. I'm going to avoid NK cells. Um, and so we can see loss of those. Um, many tumor cells um, get the ability to turn on immunosuppressive cytokines. So many tumor cells just make their own IL-10 or make their own TGF beta. So that if a T cell comes around, the tumor turns them off. And so the tumor is actively making an immunosuppressive environment and actively turning off any T cells that come near. Yeah? OK. Yeah? No. I mean, not, I mean, yeah. No. whatever you put that okay. enzyme on. <laughs> okay. Um, and so there are tons of, so tumors actually t are typically making tons of immunosuppressive molecules themselves in order to keep the environment around them immunosuppressive and suppress any T cells that are present. Um, just like tumors are able to affect um, the surrounding area to do things like make new blood vessels, um, and potentially be able to travel and do trafficking. They sometimes can actually build barriers of connective tissue and turn themselves into their own immune privilege site. Um, and so we see situations as well where we can see secretion of extracellular matrix to build a barrier and actually build an immune privilege site as well. And so different tumors are going to do all of these types of things in order to avoid responses. Finally, um, we also know that T cell exhaustion is a thing. Um, and you can imagine these tumor antigens 
are not present for a couple weeks in our patient. They are present for years and years and years. Um, as our patient gets to 10 to the eighth cells or gets to the point of picking up a lot of mutations. And so our T cells are likely going to be exhausted and unable to attack those uh, cells after some time. So eventually the tumor is going to be evading the immune system simply because the T cells are exhausted. Um, and so as those T cells see excess antigen, um, this slide is from one about infection, but it's the same thing if it's a tumor antigen. Um, our T cell gets less able to proliferate, less able to make cytokines, more likely to undergo apoptosis. And one thing that you should notice on this slide as well is our T cell makes more, as it's more exhausted, of this little blue lollipop protein called PD-1. Um, that's a, often a protein that's uh, used as a marker of exhausted T cells. Um, so we know all of these things about the immunology of cancer. Um, and so you might hear all of this, and you could be happy or sad, um, but you might say, all right, that's great. And you can even think back to my professors in grad school. And they would be like, all right, fine, sure. The immune system does something about cancer. You've convinced me. Who cares? Can we actually use any of the immunology that we know to influence cancer? Yes. <laughs> so there's one way that's real easy. So the like easiest one is, well, if we know of a pathogen that is leading to cancer formation, you make a vaccine against that pathogen. So like the pathogen encoded ones are like really obvious. So yes, we can do things like make an HPV vaccine. The HPV vaccine leads to high levels of antigens against HPV and um, basically 100% protection against um, cancers caused by HPV 16 um, and HPV 18. So in that case, like, yeah, we can definitely use the immune system to combat against cancer. But again, we might wonder, well, what about the other types of cancers that are sort of not viral or not immune related? Um, if you remember, we have this nice therapy, or we have this therapy that we use for many tumors of radiation and chemo. But we said that there was a problem with radiation and chemo. What was the problem? Yeah. It's really nonspecific. It kills the tumor cells, but all sorts of other cells too. So what we'd like is we'd like something really specific. Happily, the whole thing that the immune system is known for is being really specific. <laughs> um, and so we can take advantage of that in other ways. So one thing that people started to do is they started to actually take antibodies that could bind to either known tumor antigens or known tumor cells um, and actually put a chemotherapy drug or a radioactive molecule on the FC portion of those antibodies. And so the idea is you could deliver the chemo or the radiation directly to the tumor cells without hitting other cells because you take advantage of the fact that antibodies are super specific. And so we can see situations where we actually are bringing a uh, toxic molecule, we bind it to the FC portion of an antibody, that goes in, kills the cell, the cell uh, is no longer able to replicate, we can do radioactivity, specifically irradiate the cell, the cell undergoes DNA damage and dies. People have also done things like take FABs, um, so just individual arms of the antibody, and put on toxins or put on other things um, and treat with that, yeah. Um, because you set it up so that it's only going to mutate in close proximity to DNA by the type of radioactivity you use. Yeah. Um, how is this not more widely used? Is it still in so, so here's the question. All of this, and in fact this is true of many of the things I'm going to tell you about next, require one important piece of information. What is information is necessary? I just saw Emily say it. Antigen, you gotta know what the antigen is. If every tumor has a unique antigen, that might mean that you would have to make the, you would have to take a patient, take their tumor out, study it in the lab, find the unique antigen, develop a personal antibody for them. <laughs> so unless you have some ideas of what the antigens are, you can't really do this very well. So that's sort of the problem. 
Um, and then people looked at these types of things and said, well, wait a minute. Um, we could actually simplify this even more. What if we just use the antibodies and don't even modify them? If we just use antibodies against some of those antigens, we can do things like have NK cells kill for us. We don't even have to put the radioactivity in. Um, there are ways you can imagine complement doing the killing here too, although I don't want to get too into that. And there are a number of different antibodies that are used to kill a different cancer types by this mechanism. The most famous one is one called Herceptin. So in certain types of breast cancer, there is a known antigen, HER2 new. If a patient is, has that type of breast cancer, they can be treated with this antibody, Herceptin, which will bind to the antigen on the surface of the tumor cell and allow NK cell killing. And there are similar ones that you can see listed here. And so again, you just got to treat the patient with the antibodies. These have been outstanding drugs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, or they don't have that antigen. Perhaps the tumor cell has downregulated that antigen. kind of depends on what the, so for example, there might be some tumor types where it's like 90% do have it. And so in that case, waiting doesn't, waiting for the testing doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but yes, there, there certainly can be those types of issues. Um, and so we can just use these types of antibodies um, in order to treat patients. Now I want to point out one thing about one of these antibodies, um, just because um, it's going to come up um, in a bit. I'm going to probably reorder some of these slides just because I want to hit a couple cool things. Um, so like one of them, shown here, it's also actually at the top as rituximab, rituxin. So if you look at rituximab, it says that the antigen that rituximab binds is CD20. Um, and rituximab is used in certain lymphomas and leukemias. CD20 is on most all mature B cells. And so you're going to kill the tumor cells, but you're also going to kill all the B cells in the patient. That's better than killing all the B cells and the T cells and the NK cells and the macrophages and the lining of the GI tract and the hair. But it's still not just killing the tumor cells, and it's still going to have some negative effects. And so we've gotten better in terms of specificity here, but we're still not perfect because of the issues we have with tumor antigens. Um, there are lots of other ways that we can use the immune system to combat cancer. There's this nice figure in your textbook, and at the last second last night, I deleted that slide. And now, and I was going to write down, look at such and such figure in your textbook. And I didn't write down which one it was. So there's a figure from chapter 19 somewhere <laughs> that shows all of the ways all put together. Um, so one of the big things that people have talked about doing is the ability to use um, what's known as checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and a big part of this is we know that T cells can do stuff against tumors. They just don't, largely because they've been exhausted or they've been actively turned off to allow that tumor to be able to um, evade the immune system. So what if we turned the T cells back on? What if we said, hey, T cell, wake up? <laughs> then perhaps we could... Um, get the immune system to just go back and kill that tumor that it had originally let escape. Some people will have used antibodies um, against CTLA-4 so that we, our T cells cannot get an off signal. Other people use antibodies against PD-1, that protein that's involved in T cell exhaustion, which is also an off signal. So again, in both of these cases, we're basically blocking that T cell and never allowing it to be turned off so that it can be turned on too much and potentially kill um, the tumor cells. Um, this uh, won the Nobel Prize um, in 2018 for medicine um, in terms of thinking about this. And so this is a major way that this is working. Um, you may have heard of things like uh, Keytruda and Opdivo, I, th I think, uh, maybe Pembro. I am now putting a whole bunch of famous drug names in my head and can't remember which ones go with what. But one of, at least a couple of those are PD-1s, and they're really good. <laughs> um, I've got a few slides here about cancer vaccines, and I'm actually going to skip them um, because I want to tell you about two other therapies that I just think are really cool. <laughs> yeah. Can this lead to further cancer? 
So again, so yeah, so this has some real problematic effects. You're basically turning, you're not just turning on the anti-tumor T cells, you're turning on all the T cells. So maybe you're gonna have T cells proliferating too much. Maybe your patient's gonna get an autoimmune disease because you're turning on all their T cells. So again, we've gotten better in terms of specificity, but we're still not awesome because we don't know the antigens. So I'm gonna skip to, the, to some other cool stuff. Um, so one of the big things that people have uh, started doing is something called chimeric antigen receptor or CAR uh, T cell therapy. Um, so this little girl um, is actually the first person who was ever treated um, with CAR T cell therapy. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of some of the details of her story. Um, so what they did is they actually, so she had a tumor. It was a, it was a CD20 uh, lymphoma, the B cell tumor. You can assume that her immune system once upon a time tried to respond to it, but eventually the tumor escaped and evaded immune control. So what they did is they took some um, blood cells from this patient that should have had T cells. Um, and they gave those cells from the patient new genes. They genetically modified the, that patient's T cells. Specifically, they put in a new receptor that they had designed in the lab. This receptor involves pieces of a whole bunch of immunology proteins we've learned about. Since it's putting together pieces of different things, it's chimeric. Um, it's going to bind to the specific antigen that is on her tumor. The, so it's a chimeric antigen receptor T cell. So what they do is they are basically putting the um, heavy and light chain regions from an antibody that would bind to the antigen on her tumor. So they took part of the antibody, then they actually put part of, took a part of CD8, and they took part of CD3 so that they could get signaling in the T cell. So they could be like, see, see, I'm a T cell getting a signal. I, here's my lag, I, I bound to the antigen, and now I get CD3 signaling. Um, and in fact, in most of the newer ones, they actually put in part of CD3, uh, part of CD3 zeta, and they put in part of CD28. So it leads to both a signal one and a signal two. Sometimes they put in a whole bunch of domains from a whole bunch of different immune system receptors, so they get all the signaling cascades of T cells. All as a result of binding to this one um, ligand that is on the receptor. And so, for example, in the current CAR T cell model, this is the entire signaling cascade that happens off that one receptor. So they made those T cells in the lab, and then they put them back into the patient with the idea that these T cells are like these new T cells. They haven't been exhausted yet, and they should be able to go and kill the tumor cells. Um, I, it's, it looks like it's, it was CD19 on her tumor instead of CD20. Um, CD19 is a different B cell protein. Um, I will tell you, they did this. Um, they, and she was the first person to get it. Uh, she uh, lived happily ever after, but she was in bad shape in the hospital right after the infusion. Because it turns out that the CAR T cells killed not only all of her tumor cells, but all of her B cells as well. Um, she had a massive cytokine burst in her body and only was saved because she was still in the hospital and they could treat the excess cytokines, uh, the excess cytokine burst that she had. She had this huge excess IL-6. Um, and so, again, like, it cured her, and she's much older than this, and now is living happily ever after. But, and it's way better, it's way more specific than other things, but it's still not totally specific enough because we don't know the antigens. Um, in newer versions, people are making CAR cells that have multiple receptors. Um, so here you can see the, the CAR cell, it's binding to the tumor, it's gonna kill the tumor. Um, people are now making versions where there are multiple receptors. So say two receptors that are on the tumor, so it makes it more specific, or one that's on the tumor, but then having a negative uh, receptor, an, a turn, an inhibitory receptor 
that's on normal cells. So normal cells inhibit, but tumor cells don't inhibit and activate. And so people are now trying to put in all sorts of new combinations and do combinatorial things. They have all sorts of funny names of them. There's one of them that's called truck. And I'm always like, are you kidding? Um, and this was actually the first ever gene therapy to be approved by the FDA. Um, because I'm me, I have one other therapy I want to talk about really briefly. I know we're at 12.55, but I'm going to go fast. So there's one other thing that I, when I heard about it, I was like, this is the coolest thing I ever heard that people are thinking about. Um, and this is something that I don't get to talk about in many classes because it actually involves a fair amount of virology and a fair amount of immunology. Um, and it's something called, known as oncolytic virotherapy. You may have heard of a treatment. Um, this is actually from 60 Minutes. They did a, a whole thing about one of the oncolytic virotherapies where people were using polio against brain cancer. Um, you can actually watch it. If you Google it in 60 minutes, the whole segment is online. Um, polio and measles are the big ones that people are using. And so the idea is, well, wait, viruses are really, viruses only infect certain types of cells. They're actually really good at picking out certain types of cells and infecting them. So what if we, modif we get a virus that kills the type of cell that our tumor is in, and what if we even genetically modify the virus so in a normal cell, the virus doesn't replicate, but in a tumor cell, the virus replicates and kills the tumor. So we're basically going to infect all of the tumors with viruses and kill them that way. Um, and so like, I think that's super cool. When people, and so this has been done in a number of clinical trials, it's going really well. But one thing that has been realized about oncolytic virotherapy is that one of the reasons it works so well is that when the virus is infecting the tumor, all the cells die and you have inflammation, and it basically turns off the immunosuppression. So the tumor was immunosuppressing, and when the virus starts to infect the tumor cells, suddenly the tumor's like, hello, I am here, immune system, remember me? And, and in fact, in the end, um, it may not be that the virus is killing all of it. It may be that the virus is just reawakening immune responsiveness in that area um, and turning back on inflammation. Um, and so in the end, to understand all of these types of things, you kind of need both the immunology and the virology. And I just think it's really cool. Yeah. Um, the ones that they've been using are pretty heavily, um, pretty heavily modified and are not fast mutating viruses in the first place. Um, so um, they, they usually aren't working. And basically, once the tumor cells are gone, there are no more cells that can support the replication of the virus. So the virus dies out. Um, so these are some of the cool ways people are using this stuff um, in order to do things. Uh, I will see you guys tomorrow.